as we start talking about chemistry, we first need to talk about the different types of perspectives we have, the different types of things we'll talk about. So first, we have the macroscopic view, the microscopic view, and the symbolic view. What is chemistry? Chemistry is just trying to describe the world around us, okay? We're trying to describe nature, and that can be quite difficult to do. And to do that, we need to have visuals, visual aids that help us understand what systems are actually doing. And so the first thing we're going to look at is this idea of a macroscopic view. The macroscopic view is how we observe, observe that world around us. Every substance has a unique set of properties. And those unique set of properties are what set that substance apart from the different substance. When we're talking about the world of science, we can have different types of changes occur. We can have physical changes and we can have chemical changes. A physical change is something that changes the form or the state of the matter, but not the chemical makeup. It doesn't change the actual composition. So what I mean by that is like water in the solid phase, known as ice, being converted to water in the liquid phase, which we call water, being converted to water in the gas phase, which we often call a vapor or a gas. Something that hasn't actually changed the chemical composition. So we can see some examples down here, the melting of ice, chopping wood, spreading paper, mixing two different types of marbles together. Those are all physical changes. I haven't changed the actual chemical compound. A chemical change is something that does change the chemical makeup or chemical composition of the species. If I burn something, if I put a piece of wood in a fireplace, I have changed the chemical composition of that species. If I have a banana that's rotting, the rotting is a chemical reaction that's happening. Um, if I mix acetic acid, which, sorry, if I mix vinegar, common name um, is vinegar is ha um, acetic acid diluted, uh, dilute, dilute acetic acid. If I mix vinegar and baking soda, it makes C CO2 gas and it bubbles up at you. That's a chemical change. Lighting off fireworks, chemical change. Another thing we need to think about, and this stays with us all of chemistry, it's kind of one of those things that you need to keep not too far in the back of your mind, is this idea right here. Solids have a fixed volume and a fixed shape. Liquids have a fixed volume but a variable shape, and gases have a variable volume variable shape. And it's a little weird to think about, so let's talk about it in the respect of water. If I have water in the solid phase, I have a singular ice cube, okay? Assuming I keep that ice cube cold, it doesn't melt, I don't chip at it, I just leave it be, it's just going to stay a single ice cube. It's going to stay the same shape and the same volume that it's had the whole time. If I let that ice cube melt, let's say I put that ice cube into a glass and I let it melt. The ice cube, had, the ice cube is now in the liquid form, it's H2O liquid, and it takes on the shape of the container it's in. The ice is going to melt, it's going to form liquid water, and it's going to take on the shape of the glass I have put it in. But the volume isn't going to change. Excuse me. The volume of that water stays constant. If I pour that water into a second cup, the volume is still the same, but it takes on the shape of the second cup. So the shape is variable. If I then instead put that water into the gas phase, if I boil the water, the gas will take on the shape and volume of the container it's in. So if I put it into, let's say I, you know, pour it into one container and seal it, the gas molecules will expand to that take up that entire container. The gas volume and the gas shape are variable. It does not hold steady. The microscopic view is this idea that all matter is composed of atoms and molecules. So we will spend some time this semester talking about what an atom is and what a molecule is, and that will come very, very soon. We'll expand on these things a little bit, but just generally speaking, an atom is a small particle that cannot be made smaller and still act as a chemical system. So we have a periodic table. We're going to talk about that in just a minute, but the periodic table has 118 elements on it. Everything in our world is comprised of everything on that table. Every single thing around us, me and you, our animals, um, any of our pets that we have, any of the items we own, everything is comprised of things that are found on that table. An atom is something that is 
you can have an atom of something on that table. So like I can have an atom of iron. I can have an atom of zinc. I can have an atom of calcium. If I break it down smaller than that atom, that's when I break it down into protons, neutrons, and electrons, it no longer behaves as that atom. The atom's the smallest particle I can have and still have it behave as that system. A molecule is a group of atoms that are held together to form a unit and behave as one unit. When me and you breathe in oxygen, we are actually bringing in an oxygen molecule. Most of us don't think about it. We've heard O2, you know, if you've ever gone to the doctor and they test your O, they put that little thing on your finger and test your O2, and it gives you a little percent, um, a little percent on the machine. Hopefully you're close to 100% and it's your O2 saturation. But O2 is a molecule and it's comprised of two oxygen atoms. A compound is a substance composed of two or more elements in a fixed, definite proportion. So we will talk about that as well very, very soon. But two or more elements, fixed, definite proportion. So like uh, glucose, C6H12O6, has, is um, a f one of the forms of sugar that our body has, um, that we, have, we find um, throughout our diet and throughout our body. It has six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms to make up one molecule. We can also call that um, this idea of a compound. Sodium chloride is another example. Table salt is sodium chloride, NaCl. It has a fixed, definite um, proportion, one sodium ion to one chloride ion. And then this idea of law of conservation of mass, this is also one of those ideas that always needs to be fairly present, not too far in the back of your brain. We don't spend a lot of time on it, but it's always there, and it's always really important to what we're doing. The law of conservation of mass states, in a chemical reaction, matter, matter is neither created nor destroyed. We cannot create things. We cannot destroy things. We can change their phase. We can change their chemical composition. But if something goes into a reaction, something has to come out as well. And we see that factor in throughout all of our studies. So continuing on our microscopic, again, all matter being composed of atoms and molecules, we can have different types of substances. We can have a pure substance, which is only made up of one component, or we can have a mixture. A mixture would be something that is made of two or more components, and the proportions may vary. So examples shown here is like tea with sugar. Some people like tea with sugar, some people like it without, some people that like it with like varying amounts of sugar. It may have a different ratio of sugar in the sample, but it's still a mixture. Mixtures can be heterogeneous or homogeneous. Heterogeneous means it is not uniform throughout the whole sample. There is not a uniform appearance or composition. That would be, I've got some kind of container, I take a sample, I take and analyze a sample from the top of the container, and I take and analyze a sample from the bottom of the container, and I find different composition of the elements or molecules or compounds that comprise it. That is a heterogeneous system. It is not uniform throughout. Homogeneous is something that is uniform in appearance and or composition. A gallon of milk is a homogeneous mixture. If I take a sample of milk from the top of a gallon and a sample of milk from the bottom of the gallon and I analyze it, it would be the same composition throughout. And then we have your symbolic perspective. Your symbolic perspective is what chemists use to represent the atoms, molecules, and reactions. We have elements, and this is comprising your periodic table. The elements are the building blocks. We find them on the periodic table. They are very nicely organized for us on this table. The elements themselves is a substance that cannot be chemically broken down into a simpler substance. If it is broken down, that's when we find protons, neutrons, electrons, and it no longer behaves as that species. Note, though, that the elemental symbols do have a very specific format that we find them in. First, they're either a one-letter or two-letter abbreviation. No more than two letters. The first letter is always capitalized. If it is a single-letter abbreviation, it is automatically capitalized. If it is a two-letter abbreviation, the first letter is capitalized, the second letter is not capitalized. And this is important. Because if I write something like CO versus CO, C lowercase o means cobalt, C capital O means carbon monoxide. 
So every semester I get a couple students that tend to write everything in capital letters. Normally fine, but not when you're writing your elements. You have to write them correctly with the capital and lowercase in the correct spaces. The elemental symbols are our symbolic way of representing chemical formulas. We use this periodic table a lot. I will teach you guys how to use it as well. It has a wealth of information for us. And so the first thing you need to do is start memorizing the elemental um, names to the elemental symbols. You do not need to know their atomic numbers. You do not need to know their molar, their atomic masses. You need to know the name to symbol and symbol to name. Again, this table is helpful because it's used to communicate across languages. I can go around the world and this table is what is used. We also have your SI units and metric prefixes. You guys need to go ahead and start working on memorizing these as well. So we see our SI units. SI is our unit of standard that we use. So for mass, our unit of standard is the kilogram, which is abbreviated um, with a lowercase k and a lowercase g. We most often won't be using kilogram, no, but it is the standard um, or SI unit. And we will see that come through in some of the math we do throughout the semester. Time is in seconds. Seconds is a um, singular lowercase s. Excuse me. Distance in meters, lowercase m. Electric current in amperes, in amp, we deal with that primarily in Chem 2. Temperature in Kelvin, capital K, we'll deal with that starting in this chapter. Number of particles is the mole. We abbreviate it by dropping the E, so ML, MOL. We will see moles introduced in the next chapter. Volume, your SI unit is liters, capital L. And energy, your SI unit is joules, a capital J. Again, work on memorizing these. We will be using them throughout Gen Chem 1 and Gen Chem 2. And then your metric prefixes. You have to be comfortable with converting between these. So we're kind of, if we're starting basically here at the 10 to the 0 mark, if I'm going bigger, 1,000, let's say, I don't care what you're using. Let's just say we're going to use um, grams, okay? Let's say we're using grams here. If I have 1,000 grams, I have one kilogram. If I have 10 to the 6 grams, I have one megagram. If I have 10 to the 9th grams, I have one gigagram. If I am going lower, 10 to the negative 1 grams is one decigram. 10 to the negative 2 grams is one centigram. 10 to the negative 3 mil, um, grams is one milligram. 10 to the negative 6 is one microgram. 10 to the negative 9 is 1 nanogram, 10 to the negative 12 is 1 pico, and 10 to the negative 15 is 1 femto. These are the ones you're responsible for. I don't care which way you do it. Um, most students do it the actually, truthfully, the opposite way. They will say things like, uh, let's see, for micro, they'll say like 1 gram is equal to 10 to the 6th microgram. It does the same thing, okay? So basically, if I flip these around, it, this is 10 to the neg 10 to the positive 6 to equal one of these. This is 10 to the positive 3 to equal one of these. 10 to the positive 2 to equal one of these. 10 to the positive, I wrote my 10 in the wrong spot, one second. 10 to the positive 9 nanograms to equal one gram. I do not have a preference on which way you do it. I'm just copying what was in your book for ease. You need to know these conversions, though. You need to use these conversions, okay? Giga. Notice when we get bigger, kilo is always a lowercase k. K is used a lot in chemistry. So a kilo, a kilo is always a um, lowercase k. But mega is a capital M, and giga is a capital G. As I go smaller, they're all lowercase. Lowercase d is deci. Lowercase c is centi. Lowercase m is milli. Going to be using milli a lot, especially like milliliters. Micro is that U with the tail in front. Nano is a lowercase n. Pico, lowercase p. And femto, lowercase f. And these are the ones you're responsible for. You're also responsible for understanding your temperature conversions. So if you can memorize these um, three significant temperatures in Celsius and Calvin, you can always know the calculations. Notice here, 
the um, Celsius scale is 0 to 100, okay? 0 degrees C is where water is freezing. One hundred degrees C, water boils. That's what this graph, this graph specifically is based on. If I look at Fahrenheit, I know water boils at two twelve, and water freezes at thirty two. That's how I can actually find these two equations. I don't have them memorized. I derive them very quickly from that trend. I know that zero degrees Celsius is thirty two Fahrenheit. I know one hundred degrees Celsius is two twelve Fahrenheit. So I can derive these two equations. But you guys probably most likely are going to memorize them, and that is totally fine. If I'm going from Celsius, if I'm trying to get from Fahrenheit to Celsius, Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 1.8 gives me my Celsius. If I'm trying to go um, from Celsius to Fahrenheit, Celsius times 1.8 and then add the 32 gets me to Fahrenheit. Absol that is important to know. This is absolutely vital to know. The Kelvin scale is our measure of temperature that we use. It's our SI base unit. Again, up here, temperature, sorry, wrong button. Uh, temperature Kelvin scale, capital K, that is our SI base unit. The Kelvin scale is known as an absolute scale. What that means is there's no negative values. It was developed so that we can intentionally have a scale that never goes negative. When Kelvin goes down to zero, that is what we call absolute zero. That is the coldest, absolute coldest. That is the point where all motion ceases. No movement at all. No molecule is moving at all. Zero Kelvin. It is not negative. It's just zero. To convert between Celsius and Kelvin, we take that temperature in Celsius and we add 273.15 to it and that gets us to Kelvin. So Calvin, its units is just a singular capital K. Let's go ahead and practice one quick conversion with that, converting 25.0 degrees C to Calvin. I have degree C, I'm trying to get to Calvin. I know Calvin is degree C plus 273.15. We're going to cover sig figs in the different modules, so you're going to have to trust me right now. But if I have 25.0 degrees C plus 273.15, this gives me 298.15 Kelvin. But because of sig fig rules, which again, we are going to cover separately, I'm going to round this and I'm going to get 298.2 Kelvin as my final answer. So again, to go from Celsius to Kelvin, all I've done is added 273 to my answer. 273.15, I apologize. I've added 273.15. Next example, convert 525 Kelvin to degrees Celsius. And I don't actually have this written down, so one second, okay. When I do this, so going from Kelvin to degrees Celsius, I need to subtract 273.15. My degree C, I'm starting off with 525 Kelvin, I'm subtracting 273.15, and I get a calculated answer here of 251.85. Again, you're just going to have to trust me right now when it comes to sig figs. I'm going to push this down here. When I do my sig figs on this, I'm going to round this to my ones position because that's how precise my measurement is here. We're going to cover that in a different module. I get 252. I can't forget my units here, and this one is degrees Celsius.